Hi, everybody. My name is Anne. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and I am one half of Pop Up Archive, but Bailey Smith, my co founder, is also here today. And um, we'll be happy to, to meet, hopefully, some of you uh, at 5 30 at the, at the demo session. We'll have a, a laptop set up. Um, we started Pop Up Archive at the UC Berkeley School of Information um, and then received funding last year through the Knight Foundation's News Challenge um, to continue full-time work on a web-based system for organizing and creating access to archival audio. Um, so I thought I would share some of the experiences that we've had so far uh, working with oral history archives, uh, media organizations, content creators in the course of our work, um, and then highlight some of the common digital preservation needs we've observed, particularly with audio, um, and talk a little, little bit about how we're trying to um, answer those needs. Um, so let's start with the tale of an archive. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Kitchen Sisters before. Um, our work began with them when they came to us three years ago in a state of self-described archival crisis. Um, they're independent radio producers who have uh, been working in public radio based in the San Francisco Bay Area for over three decades. You may have heard their work syndicated on NPR. Um, they've recorded thousands of hours of sound uh, over the course of their career. And they've worked with countless oral historians, uh, archival sound collections, universities, libraries, you name it, in addition to recording interviews with uh, Americans, from people from all walks of life and parts of the world and moments in collective history, um, collective memory. So this is a photo um, on the right, or a, a, a piecemeal of photos that Bailey took of a mere fraction of the Kitchen Sisters audio. And when we met them, they were awash with content, but very short on organization. Uh, they kept a file maker log for their audio. They backed it up to hard drives and via FTP to a server. Uh, but the drives don't always last. Uh, the server could be unreliable. And the files were organized with minimal description um, in various formats in locations all over the place, from their office in San Francisco to a storage unit to Nikki's house under her bed in Santa Cruz, California. <laughs> Um, and they get requests from the public and scholars and other producers or media stations all the time uh, to access this material and reuse it, repackage it. And it's usually impossible, um, if not very uh, difficult, uh, for them to fulfill these requests. Um, as time passes, they forget where it is themselves um, or that it even exists at all. Uh, and they're certainly not the only ones. Um, there are a lot of small organizations out there with analog assets in need of preservation. Um, but, especially for the small guys who aren't affiliated with libraries or universities, um, they're not necessarily well positioned to secure the grant funding that is required for these expensive digitization tasks. Um, and they're definitely not well versed enough in archival science um, to properly address questions of preservation and access, uh, especially uh, with a technological landscape that's changing as rapidly as it is. Um, so we set out to help. Uh, for our master's thesis at Berkeley, um, we surveyed the digital archiving and public media ecosystems um, to see if we could identify a solution that would meet the Kitchen Sisters' needs while also keeping in mind these restrictions, um, resources, uh, workflow, and lack of technical proficiency. Um, we saw the need for an inexpensive tool um, that could be used by oral history and archives and media creators alike uh, to store and or create access to their material safely and make it discoverable in a way that would be standardized with their industries. Um, so we, uh, for our master's thesis, worked on plugins for the open source web exposition software Omeka, some of you may know. Um, we love Omeka, they have an incredible development team and institutional backing out of George Mason University that uh, makes them reliable and, and we found easier to use with a lower barrier to entry than a lot of the comparable software um, we were looking at. The plugins that we wrote enable um, you to back up media at the Internet Archive through Omeka or publish audio files to SoundCloud. And if that's interesting to anyone in the room, please talk to us because we're always looking for people to help us test them. Um, but we realized that there were a lot of other small organizations in the same boat um, as the Kitchen Sisters who didn't have the benefit of me and Bailey devoting an entire year of academic inquiry to their archival challenges. Um, and maybe even more importantly, we realized that without context, metadata, uh, transcripts, 
tags that you can search. Um, digital audio files are pretty useless. Um, and significantly, whether individuals or organizations, um, no one, virtually no one, has had the time and the money um, and the staff to generate the kind and the volume of metadata that you need for meaningful access to archival audio. Um, so as a result, audio that's absolutely worth saving is getting lost and deleted all the time, preaching to the choir. Um, so maybe I'll list some concrete examples of these problems first um, and give a sense for how this lack of access to audio is creating problems that are common across uh, the domains that, that we dealt with, both individuals and institutions. Um, there are small archival audio collections um, sitting in silos around the country. We've been talking to them. Their collections aren't transcribed, uh, and they're lacking the finding aids that could put them into the hands of scholars, producers, uh, content creators across the web. The Society of American Baseball Research, for example, came to one of the uh, digital archiving webinars we held looking for a storage solution that would be an improvement on Box.com. Um, and also to drive ears to their amazing collection of voices from American baseball history. Um, we have talked to reporters at media stations around the country who are frustrated because their raw audio gets deleted or moved to deep storage every month or a few months, um, and they're getting requests from other reporters or even themselves for archival material, like uh, recordings from Occupy Oakland over the course of the last year and a half, um, and they can't provide it. And as a result, they and other media creators are going to YouTube as their primary source for archival audio. Uh, we visited WBUR a few months back in Boston, and they were gearing up for their coverage of the Whitey Bulger trial, and had a room full of crates of interviews that, that one reporter had collected over the course of the decades that he's been covering the case. Um, and today, those interviews, when they're created, are born digital, uh, and are often disappearing before they have a chance to make it into the equivalent of a crate. Um, the Broadcast Board of Governors distributes Voice of America in 52 languages to countries around the world, um, and they have no consistent way for searching across variations on the term Barack Obama. Um, and so we realized that absolutely we wanted to provide a service for smaller organizations and a lightweight system that could double as an effect, but as, and a lightweight system, but that it could double as an effective tool for opening up larger institutions, collections. Um, and act as a, a layer on top of the existing content management systems that they had in place. Um, it's absolutely true a radio station and an oral history archive might have different end goals for their audio, sure. Um, but once it's digital, the methods for achieving their respective goals are uh, remarkably similar. Um, and I say that for one main reason. Um, and particularly in the context of audio that contains speech. Um, once audio is digital, it can also be made searchable. Uh, through various transcription technologies, whether speech-to-text, uh, platforms for crowdsourcing, natural language processing, semantic analysis, some combination of all of them. Um, these technologies have come far enough in recent years and are at a point right now that we knew we would want to incorporate them um, into our ideal digital preservation solution for audio. So, uh, searchability, one major common goal we identified across domains. Two other common needs that we set out to address uh, number one, batch ingest, automated, ideally, um, whether we're talking about backlogs and archival holdings or ongoing production moving forward. And then number two, transcoding files into multiple formats so that they'll be compatible with future systems, which is something the Internet Archive, for example, is really great at doing. Um, but the uh, nagging voice in the back of our minds this whole time was telling us that if we were trying to integrate better digital preservation practices into existing workflows, given existing resources, if we really wanted to enable the often unknowing stewards of culturally significant digital media to do the right thing, that it had better be something that's fun to use. Um, so we found ourselves thinking about, in the words of one of our beta testers, uh, how to create an archiving experience that's as easy, as, easy to use as Facebook. Um, a more robust organizational solution for audio than Dropbox, um, but with less rules or hoops to jump through than you might find with some uh, existing content management tools. Uh, the sweet spot in between managing content in a standardized way with lightweight web tools and APIs, enabling access across teams and organizations, but also uh, an online access solution with meaningful and structured metadata for what was previously searchable only by filing. Um, so since January, we've been developing Public Archive, working with developers of the Public Radio Exchange. Uh, we started alpha and beta testing in March, 
and we're ramping up to launch the service officially this fall. Um, it is a simple web-based application. Uh, you don't have to download or administer your own software. And users can sign in through Facebook, Twitter, uh, radio producers can use their PRX accounts. You can add audio files one at a time or in batches. You can drag and drop. You can use a spreadsheet to reference remote URLs. You can link to your SoundCloud account. Um, and then for organizations with existing systems, we're monitoring their XML feeds. Uh, we're listening to their servers via FTP or authenticating to their APIs. Um, we're harnessing new technologies to automate the transcription and then derive semantic entities from those transcripts, tags, uh, to make audio searchable in more illustrative ways than your typical Google search result or YouTube search result, as the case may be. Um, and the transcripts vary widely in quality, of course, which you can see for yourself later today if you want to test the system out. Um, so we're experimenting with additional processing and ways of improving the tags and the transcripts. Um, the example on the screen right now, not that you can read it, is um, using text from the Southern Oral History Project at UNC Chapel Hill, actually. Um, and on the left is the automatically generated transcript. On the right is what we get uh, after running it through Calais open source keyword extraction software. Um, so with this type of better content management, you can obviously search the transcript, or in the absence of a transcript, uh, you can apply tags, keywords, interviewers, interviewees, um, if they haven't been automatically generated already. Um, we also wanted to connect people to um, free storage through the Internet Archive, because it's so amazing, and then also offer them private storage options, or the ability to integrate with their existing storage, like uh, SoundCloud or Google Drive. So I think I may be preaching to the choir once again uh, when I point out the importance of standards in, in all of this and the continued preservation of this media. Um, our metadata schema is based on PB Core, a public broadcasting standard based in turn on Dublin Core. Um, and we're using that to describe audio right now, but it can be extended for video and other media formats. Um, before the digital age, producers certainly were unlikely to mark up their audio because it was difficult, it was time consuming, there was little clear payoff. Um, and even archives lacked the resources, like I've said, to provide the volume and the, and the quality of finding aids for large collections or to open those collections to wider potential audiences. Um, that value proposition is changing now for everyone, because um, this type of markup and relatively automated organization is more within reach than ever before. Um, and with it come new opportunities for wider audiences and distribution. Um, so we're really excited to be involved in these communities at this point in time um, and paying close attention to some of the um, bigger cross-institutional efforts, whether in public media, the American Archive Content Inventory Project, the Public Media Platform, Digital Public Library of America, um, as we attempt to solve gaps in workflow around content creation, production, and preservation so that an interview with the next Miles Davis doesn't slip through the cracks. Um, historically, archiving has happened at the institutional level, um, and that continues to improve, and, and, and we like to watch and learn from it, but individuals and small organizations, as we all know, are increasingly responsible for archiving themselves, um, which is what led us to ask the question, what is reasonable to expect individuals to do to undertake themselves when it comes to archiving? Uh, the large organizations will always have more resources, um, and they'll come up with in-house solutions, and so what we're thinking about most now is how all of these stakeholders can better communicate with each other um, and the importance of standards in enabling that communication um, and then providing tools so that we can enable the smaller players to speak the same language as the bigger players and ideally do it quickly and innovatively enough that the methods we're discovering will, will ultimately inform workflows at some of the bigger institutions as well. Thank you. Questions now. I might have a minute or two, but otherwise, also at 5:30, we'll be around. Yes. Is that Kara? Hi. <laughs> okay. Hi. Uh, Hi. Talk really loud. So, um, as you mentioned in, in the descriptions of the kinds of problems that you see with these different producers um, and different content creators, is traditionally they're not that great stewards of their own content, and for good reason, like they're busy making content, right? Mm -hmm. So that's never been their focus. But um, one of the challenges with moving into the digital world is that a lot of uh, bad practices just replicate themselves in a new environment. And it seems like to make, to avoid that, you really have to make it um, 
of benefit to them immediately. Like they have to see the value in it for themselves mm -hmm. at this time, not in the future, you know, because that's, that's not as great of a business case for them. So other than making it fun and simple, how do you make it so that they will be incentivized to use it now? Um, what benefit do they see immediately? And, um, and or like, how can you make it so they do absolutely nothing? Um, I would say in our experience so far, the transcripts play a really big part in that. People get so excited when they see their their audio automatically transcribed that they that it, it's beyond fun at that point and they can't stop doing it. Um, it's created a lot more work for us, which is a good thing, and that people want transcripts of varying quality. Some people are just roughly logging tape. Some archives have you know tens of thousands of hours of sound that they just want to you know have any finding aids for. Um, and so we're kind of working on providing a range of options for, you know, from the from the person who wants a, a, an absolutely perfect transcript, um, or, or organization that needs to be putting transcripts up on their site, um, and would pay more of a premium for that versus um, just trying to get stuff in and get people to save it. Um, yeah. I have one other response to that, but I'll let him ask a question, and we can talk about it. Yeah. I'm not familiar with DDEX, no, but I'd love to hear more about it. Well, it's DDEX.net. Uh, I'm, I'm a member. I'm certainly not a, a here to advocate them. But uh, I was just curious because a lot of what you speak of in terms of double core, DD core, things like that, uh, they have a very extensive uh, XML approach for handling this type of stuff. And the constituency is essentially all the e-commerce content holders and the e-commerce uh, deliver, deliver, delivery mm -hmm. mechanisms, you know, streaming, uh, uh, podcast downloads, etc. And I was just curious if that had been a part of your review process. No, it hasn't been, but I'm, you've piqued my interest now. I'm going to have to to find out about it. Um, all right, I'm going to I'm going to go, but I hope to talk to you soon. <laughs>